Well, welcome, uh, everybody. That was not an exhortation, by the way. I hope you did manage to get a sandwich. Uh, uh, by all means, keep eating if you haven't finished it. Uh, I'm Giles again, an editor at Tortoise, and this is, as Liz said, the session about trees. But I think slash hope that it may end up being about more than that besides. Forgive me for indulging very briefly in a trip down memory lane. I was once privileged to go to paradise, a bit of paradise uh, that they were, that has always been at, at, for the past hundred years at threat of being paved over. Long story short, a, an activist with a uh, code name took me to a secret place in Northern California where what uh, we were told was the world's largest redwood was growing. And um, the had to remain secret. I had to promise not to report where it was. Uh, and I wrote a story about it and it was uh, beautiful and mesmerizing, uh, containing literally thousands of tons of sequestered carbon. And um, I, I, th I thought about that when thinking about this session because in, in a sense, um, uh, these trees hog all the attention. And, and one, of the, one of the questions that I wanted to get at, besides the nitty gritty of the extent to which reforestation can help us reach climate goals, is the, is the extent to which they may be like megafauna trees in, in, in other debates about the natural environment, in that they are so attractive uh, and relatively easy to understand. Uh, question, by focusing on them, do we distract ourselves from the complexities of, of the global challenge that we face? Um, uh, certainly, and I was discussing this briefly with one, with one of our guests, who I'll introduce in a second, uh, when Tom Crowther, a British researcher, um, did some big new research on numbers of trees and land available for reforestation, it proved pretty controversial a couple of years ago. Uh, and, you know, it, it turns out that, broadly speaking, uh, tree planting done wrong can be controversial. And yet um, there's a simple fact that uh, they are wonderful, ubiquitous, straightforward, natural carbon sinks. And surely they have to be a part of any uh, uh, overall strategy for, for confronting uh, climate change. Um, you know the drill. <clears throat> Most of you will know the drill. If, if you haven't been to a thinking before, welcome. Um, I will try and bring in as many voices as possible from the chat. My colleague Ellen is, is there with you, with us. Uh, my colleague Tom is on the tech. Um, let me introduce our guests. We have with us Tom Rivet Karnak. Hi, Tom, uh, whose credential is only that he landed the 2015, uh, I, I exaggerate only slightly, uh, Paris Climate Agreement, along with Christiana Figueres and with whom he founded Global Optimism. Uh, we have Rebecca Braswell with us, a co-founder of the Land Life Company, uh, which does the hard work of actual forestation in, uh, on degraded land all over the world. And Matthew Hay, who, oh, I think Matthew, you, we've, yes, you were having trouble, but I can actually see you, terrific, from Reforesting Scotland and Forest Carbon. Uh, because we always run out of time, let, let's get, straight into this. And let me start with you, Tom. Um, I suggested at the top there that whatever else they are, uh, trees are totemic, um, but at the same time, they're practical carbon sinks. And I know that you concern yourself with the big picture here. Where do trees, where does forestation fit into your conception of uh, how we as a species need to tackle climate change. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you very much for thanks for having me. And uh, I loved your opening story. I, when I was a child, I thought code names would play a much larger part in life than they've turned out to. So it's nice to hear them mention that. Um, so I think a few things. I think, first of all, to sort of start off from, from where you started, um, trees are part of what makes life so wonderful, right? I mean, they're part of what makes us fall in love with the natural world and realize the web of life and realize that we want to dedicate our lives towards this amazing planet that we exist on. So I think that's the bedrock. And I think we need to be a bit too careful um, to not commoditize that too much and to actually allow ourselves to appreciate that fact and how wonderful it is. And if you talk to people about their deepest and most 
wild and wonderful experiences in their lives, often they involve wooded landscapes, forests, something like that. So that's the bedrock that I would start on. At the same time, it is undeniable that the situation that we find ourselves in with respect to climate change and how desperate and how late this situation has become and why this decade is now really the do or die decade has at least as much to do with the fact that we have cut the world's trees down and destroyed forests as we've also dug up ancient life forms in the form of hydrocarbons. And both of them, to my mind, have to be fundamental parts of how we address this. And just a piece of data that I saw the other day that's sort of flying around inside the government at the moment, thinking about climate strategy for the COP. Um, we are 29 gigatons of reduction short of a 1.5 degree trajectory in 2030. We need to find 29 gigatons of additional reductions. Now, a strong Chinese commitment that we're all expecting might get us five. The US commitment got us two. The EU was less than one. So you can pretty quickly see that we're falling fairly far short of that 29 degree reduction. And if you then do the maths on the areas that could deliver something meaningful that could really help, the predominant one is restoring canopy cover and restoring degraded land. So that absolutely has to be a front and center part of our overall response to this moment of crisis and actually get to a point where we've reforest the planet as part of this response. And the final thing I'll say, which goes back to the beginning is, Christiana and I just wrote our book, The Future We Choose, and in it at the beginning, we set out these two different futures, one where we've dealt with this issue and one where we haven't. And people don't really respond emotionally to the idea that the world in 30 years is run on renewable energy or cars are electric. I mean, to many of us, these changes are gonna be somewhat invisible, but they do respond to the idea that we've reforested the planet and we've brought back biodiversity and many of these things that we remember as children. It's an essential part of getting people on board with this trajectory. It's an essential part of the action we need to take to, to actually reduce emissions and make it feasible, I think it's inseparable. And we can get into some of the complexity later. Thanks, Tom. I should have said, by the way, that um, Tom has recorded a, a memorable lockdown TED talk um, in amongst trees near where you live, yes. Um, fair to say that you personally find them pretty inspirational. I mean, I think they're, I think they're, a, they're a fundamental bedrock part of life, spending time in the woods, absolutely. Mm. Thank you. Rebecca, um, let me come to you. Uh, you explained when we spoke yesterday uh, a, a key point, uh, a technical point about trees, which is that as they grow, they absorb carbon. Mm -hmm. When they stop growing or as they decompose, they do emit it. So it, it's complicated. Um, uh, on one of the slides, just as we were starting, we had as a ballpark figure for the area of the planet available for reforestation, 500 million hectares. I, I'd be interested to know your take on that figure. But um, more broadly, since it's the business you're in, can you just sort of set out for us how you feel in, in sort of practical terms, trees can help and and over what's what sort of area i mean i know you deal specifically with degraded land but when you look at sit back and, and look at the big picture wh what is the amount of the planet that in practical terms we're talking about sure um let me start first with kind of how the how the carbon feeds into this and and the role that trees can play you know as tom mentioned trees are going to play a very important role in creating the the world's carbon sinks that are required and i think where they are potentially undervalued in that um, conversation is that climate change, um, the Paris Accords, the number of degrees we're trying to uh, cool the earth by is very intangible or untangible to your average person. Whereas a tree, everyone has their favorite first camping trip, uh, their favorite local park where they walk their dog. Everyone can connect to a tree and to make sense a little bit about what the magnitude of the challenges we are facing and to connect that to something very tangible uh, and something that a lot of people do in their lives or are a cultural tradition where they live to plant trees is going to be a powerful tool. And so what we do as land life is try to convince companies to compensate for their carbon emissions by planting trees. And one of the arguments that we use is that 
This is tangible and relatable. Your climate action will be transparent to people. It'll be visible to people. And that's a really important part of the debate because the exact, uh, the magnitude of the challenge, the number of actual space where we can plant trees is so humongous. And we have to have such strong plans to get there. To me, that's way less important than having the momentum, the public support and the funding to make that happen. Because uh, we can we can define that area uh, uh, down to the uh, square meter if we want, but if we don't have the tools and the 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 momentum for that to happen, you know, understanding that exact uh, number of hectares isn't uh, isn't going to get us very far. So that's where I struggle sometimes with the the, the granular debates um, that play out about a plantable area or is it, you know, ten trillion trees versus a trillion trees. The point is to start creating action, um, and we need to find very tangible pathways for that to, for that to happen with people. The second thing I would say about trees in this whole climate debate is this sort of unfortunate singular focus on carbon as their sole benefit. Um, and I think that it's understandable and that it's a traded commodity. There's a market for it. But the impact that we're going to have with reforestation on biodiversity, on recreating habitats, on the whole host of ecosystem services is really what the climate movement and climate mitigation is all about. And somehow that, again, other tangible points that people can really grasp onto, clean air, clean water, um, those are sort of lost in the, in the conversation with this focus only on carbon and that value of, of tree um, uh, storing carbon. So that's a little bit about the, the carbon in tree. What I would say about the, the natural cycle of forests is um, it is important for people to understand that trees die, that this is a natural uh, cycle in nature. And the challenge is we have so much land where that natural cycle is not taking place, right? These are areas that have been deforested, denuded. Uh, they're completely degraded, which means that nature is not gonna come back on its own. That's the UN definition of degraded land. Some form of intervention is going to be required. And the challenge is how do we kickstart that natural cycle again? We've destroyed it. We've destroyed something completely complex. And now we're gonna try to redesign it through reforestation. And so that's where that how we do it becomes such an important question because there's a lot of momentum for tree planting right now, but we can't let everyone just run off and, and plant trees, not knowing the right mix of species, densities, times of years to plant, et cetera. The how is really critical to the success of climate mitigation. And so many people can tell you how many trees they've planted. Not many people can tell you how many trees are alive today. And if we are taking an outcomes focused view on this, then that are, those are sort of the metrics that we need to start checking and that we need to start holding people accountable to how they plant trees and are they achieving the ecosystem goals that we've set out to achieve. Okay, well, Rebecca, tell us then briefly, uh, describe for us the word picture of yep. a, a project that you're involved in. We, uh, you mentioned Spain, for example. Yep. Uh, what are you doing there exactly that, um, that helps, that is not, for example, monoculture, how, how is it different from that? Yeah. So in Spain, for example, is um, the fastest growing desert in Europe is in Spain. Um, and that is due to rising temperatures and a large, uh, large form of rural abandonment, right? So a lot of land that was clear for agriculture, farmed for, for hundreds of years, uh, has now been abandoned as people move to the cities, which means you have completely denuded landscapes where nature is not coming back on its own. Which and part so, of Spain is this? Uh, we operate mainly in Castilla León in northern Spain. Okay. Um, and so what we're doing out there is we are trying to figure out what the native uh, forests look like. So the one of the benefits about agriculture is they will, they will clear one field. And if it's, they don't need the adjacent field because it's on a slope or what have you, or it's rocky, they don't clear it. So we actually have pictures of what the forest should look like. So you see these patches of forest everywhere that have been untouched by agriculture or mining or what have you. So you basically have a picture of what you want to recreate. And then what we do is we work backwards from that picture uh, to understand what happened. What are the species that are in that composition in that forest? And we look at the past, but we also look at the future, right? So what are the climate uh, predictions, what are what is going to be a resilient species mix for the future. So the way I like to think about it is 
We look at the past and we look at the future to inform what we should do today. And that is very granular around your species selections, your planting windows, uh, and how you and how you plant those trees. So you're not necessarily just trying to recreate what was there, but but is there the prospect um, of large-scale forest rebirth? And, and, and if so, how long is it going to take and do we have that time? Yeah, so funny, a funny story. I was in Spain last week uh, to monitor trees we had planted uh, three years ago. And uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with oaks, uh, but some of them were about uh, uh, 10 centimeters tall after three years. These are really rough landscapes. And um, fortunately, for those of you who do know oaks, you know that they invest in their root systems first. So we're really hoping that below ground, it's a very uh, rich and vibrant uh, uh, tree that's growing, but it takes a significant amount of time. These trees are gonna reach maturity or, or start, to, start to hit their kind of optimal carbon capture potential around 20 years. Uh, they will capture their, most of their carbon between years 20 and 30, and then it will plateau around year 40, at which, you know, they're, they're mostly a mature, a mature tree after 40 years, if you're looking at kind of Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean climates. So you can see how long this is going to take. There's this great, uh, great Chinese proverb that the, the best time to plant a tree was uh, 20 years ago. The second best time is today. This is, uh, this is going to take time, which is why we need to get started, which is why we need to have that momentum and the public support uh, and the funding for tree planting so that it actually gets started because we're looking at an impact that is unfortunately decades out. Uh, Rebecca, thank you very much. Um, we'll come back to, to both of you uh, and we'll come to uh, some voices in the room as well shortly, but let me come to Matthew. Uh, Matthew Hay, um, your Bailiwick, if I'm still allowed to use that word, is Scotland. Um, I once went up there to do a story for Tortoise about uh, reforestation on previously grazed land. And there was a word that was I, escapes me, but it was really, really important to qualify for grants for uh, carbon sequestration. You had to prove that uh, that it was extra. What is the word? Additionality. Additionality. Yeah. OK. Um, Tell us um, a bit about uh, what you do and how you prove additionality. And also, I wanted to ask, within the UK, um, Scotland is the biggest um, uh, area available for reforestation. But are you ever daunted by the notion that it may be a drop in the ocean globally? Yes, um, in a word. Uh, let me let me come to all of those in turn, and and um, sure. and if it's all right, I'll I'll start with the drop in the ocean because it's something I think about a lot. Um, but as an individual, or even as an organisation, whether you're a charity or a small business like the ones I work for, you know, you've got to be pragmatic. You've got to be realistic about what you can achieve within the parameters of of your life. And the mantra "Think global, act local" really speaks to me. And I very much believe that, you know, we have a, a, um, there's an onus on us in the UK and in Scotland to sort of get our own house in order and to do everything we can um, to be trailblazers if possible and, and, um, and set the standard. Um, and, you know, when it comes to innovation around carbon offsetting or ecosystem markets to prove that there are ways to do this, um, that, you know, provide examples that others can follow. So, um, yes, I, I am daunted by how small you know, a country we are, but you can only do what you can do and you've got to start somewhere. And, you know, it's incredibly important. I'm sure the other panelists will agree with me when you think about reforestation, that you do start from a very local level. You start with engagement of local stakeholders, local people and local tree species. The provenance of the trees and the other species that you want to have in your woodland is absolutely vital to the overall ecological health of that forest system. So, that really is my mantra and, um, and it sort of helps me to be a bit less daunted. But um, to, your, to your question about additionality, additionality is a specific term that's used with ecosystem markets. So wherever you're trying to uh, generate money from selling an ecosystem service, be that carbon sequestration or biodiversity gain or flood mitigation, you need to demonstrate that whatever you are selling is additional, i.e., that it wasn't going to happen anyway. It wasn't going to be delivered by business as usual. 
Um, and that's really important because the whole point of these markets is to incentivize the creation of, for instance, new carbon sinks. And at the same time, whoever's investing in those markets, whether they're a business looking to purchase carbon offsets uh, or to demonstrate that they've had some impact in delivering biodiversity gain, they need to have the assurance that their money has actually made a difference. And so for them, the additionality is key. It proves that their money had a tangible impact on the ground, delivering something that wasn't going to happen anyway. Um, but I, I must... how do you do it? How... How, how do you demonstrate additionality? Yes, yeah, a very good question. So in the UK and within the reforestation context, we're lucky enough to have a, a really good carbon standard in the Woodland Carbon Code. And there are carbon standards all over the world. They're operated by organizations like VERA with their verified carbon standard, gold standard, lots of people would have heard of as well. But in the UK, we have two domestic carbon standards that apply to uh, carbon within specific ecosystems. We have the Woodland Carbon Code for woodlands and the Peatland Code for peatlands. And they allow landowners and land managers to generate carbon funding for projects that they want to do, whether that's woodland creation or peatland restoration. And both of those codes obviously take additionality very seriously and they have a series of tests uh, that every project has to pass for it to evidence its additionality. There are legal tests and there are financial tests um, and they're very important and, and they, you know, without going into the detail too much, you essentially have to show your cash flow and show that your project would not have been financially viable without the existence of, in this case, the carbon market and without the possibility of generating carbon income from that market. And only if you can evidence that financial additionality will you be able to have your project registered with the Woodland Carbon Code. And so that standard is there and it's vital for, you know, giving everyone confidence in the integrity of this market. Thanks, Matthew. I, I want to um, come straight back to you with a, a question that's been put in the chat by Ode. Um, uh, I'll, I'll ask it myself, Ode, if you don't mind, but if there's other stuff that you want to bring up, please say so in the chat. Can you compare preserving existing forest versus planting new trees? I mean, the, one can pose that in two senses. Um, is preserving existing forest a product that you offer? That's one thing. And the other is, uh, in terms of carbon sequestration, which is best? In terms of carbon sequestration, the creation of new woodlands is best. But we're being very specific here. As Rebecca alluded to, you know, the carbon sequestration rates in new forests and woodlands peak sort of 15 to 35 years into their existence. And by the time you reach 100 years, depending on what part of the world you're in, you've mostly plateaued such that the forest carbon sequestration is balanced by emissions from that woodland. And so in this sense, your forest starts life as a carbon sink. And once it matures, it becomes a carbon store. And they're both absolutely vital. And it's, it, it, you know, it's, it, it's slightly facile to try and, you know, say which one's more important, because we definitely need to remove carbon from the atmosphere if, if we're going to have any hope of staying below the 1.5 degree threshold. Uh, and, and in that sense, carbon sinks are vital. But if you in any way um, disrupt the existing carbon stores that old growth forests present, uh, then you're going to be releasing carbon into the atmosphere, which again, we can't afford to be doing. And the, the other point here is that's absolutely vital to get across is this focus on carbon. You know, we have to, it's, it's very right and appropriate that we're focusing on carbon, but we cannot ignore the other environmental crisis we face, which is of course the declining ecological health of our planet. And that's where old growth forests really pack a punch. They're enormous carbon stores, but it's the biodiversity that they harbor and that they house that I think is so important and so valuable. And when we create new forests, unless we're doing it through natural regeneration, we're often planting you know, fairly species poor, even aged woodlands. And there's just no way that for, you know, for a very long time, they're gonna be packing the biodiversity punch of an old growth forest. So. In answer to the question, we, we absolutely need both. We need to preserve the old growth forests and we need to maintain existing forests far better than we're doing. Um, but at the moment, a lot of the focus is on creating new carbon sinks. And, uh, and that's in part due to markets like the carbon offsetting market being geared towards that through the generation of carbon credits. Uh, thanks, Matthew. In, in a second, if possible, I want to come to David Wood because he's made an interesting point uh, in the chat about uh, 
the flippability of rainforests, if I can put it that way. Uh, but uh, can I ask um, all three of you very briefly, were you, should we be encouraged uh, by Bolsonaro's performance at the um, summit in, uh, hosted by Biden last week, at which I think for the first time he said, fine, I am willing to commit to protecting large chunks of the Amazon in return for money. Is this new? Is, is, uh, should we be cheerful? Uh, who should we go to first? Rebecca. Yeah, so I, um, there's been a lot of criticism of asking him or of him asking the world for money to do this. And I don't have a problem with it at all. I think until the world stops eating meat, stops using an immense amount of paper for their packaging, uh, stops, you know, traveling as, as much as we want, whenever we want, creating the demand for the services that the Amazon and creating the incentives to cut down the Amazon and to strip it of all of its, you know, riches for lack of a better work. Until that demand ceases to exist, I think we're all complicit in this, in this challenge. Um, and if he is going to put in place the governance and the management of that protection, then I don't see why the rest of the world wouldn't fund it. Right. Uh, any dispute on that, um, uh, Tom? Well, I mean, I, I'll, I'll take what I can get from Bolsonaro. It's been a tough ride with him there. And, um, you know, he, he, he said something, and that's better than not saying anything. So, so, so that's the positive side. I mean, I think that, you know, one, one sort of analysis of what happened there is he kind of panicked at the summit because he had nothing to say. He was on the world stage with everyone else and he wanted to say something. I believe I saw some reports that actually he was then slashing budgets of relevant departments that were going to be responsible for implementing some of those ideas within a week of having made the statement. So personally, I think, you know, we, we need to be fairly sceptical as to whether any of that will come through. But I would also just double down on what Rebecca just said. I mean, this LEAF coalition that came out that had an interesting array of governments and corporations behind it, basically to transfer funds to maintain standing forests. I think that's a wholly good thing. And I think that mm -hmm. actually, if we can find a platform where there are accountability mechanisms, you know, the availability of satellites now to track what's happening is a bit of a game changer in this regard as well. That's a good thing. And we should take all the momentum we can get. Just on, on that Bolsonaro pledge, in the context, one billion, which is what he asked for, is a comically low sum, isn't it? <clears throat> um, uh, well, let me put that to, to Matthew, since I, I promised to come to all of you on this particular subject. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, in, in the context of, you know, global financial markets, it isn't very, very much at all. Um, and, and so in that sense, it maybe represents an undervaluing um, of the Amazon. I mean, it almost certainly does, even if you can value that region financially. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I echo what the others say. I think it's any recognition from Bolsonaro about the importance of that ecosystem is a step in the right direction. Um, and I, I, you know, I do have some um, well, I do have some feeling that, that part of this problem isn't just throwing money at Brazil, where there will be regions in very remote parts of Brazil where the government governance isn't in place necessarily to halt deforestation. I mean, part of this, as, as Rebecca alluded to, is having a good long look at Western supply chains and where the animal feed that our meat heavy diets is coming from and the drivers for the deforestation that make it a lucrative and viable prospect for the people who live in that region. And I think it's very important that we do put pressure on Brazil to, to, to be good stewards of their country, but also we look at you know, our impacts, uh, even if they are slightly clandestine. And, and then to come back to the, you know, the original comment you had from the floor about you know, the flippability of this ecosystem, I think that's another very important point is that we can throw all the money we like at Bolsonaro. If we let global temperatures increase you know, much more, then large parts of the Amazon are going to they are going to transform into a savanna ecosystem because it will either become too warm or too dry for closed canopy rainforest to be the climax ecosystem in that part of the world. And, and I think that's a really important reminder of just how global this problem is, how international, how intertwined it is. And the fact that, you know, you can be doing everything you like in your own country, but unless the rest of the planet is playing ball, we are going to see some planetary feedbacks kick in that just inexorably move us uh, whether at a, an ecosystem level or at, a, or at a planetary level into different stable states. Thanks, Matthew. Well, th this was the point that I wanted to ask David about. Um, 
uh, how worried are you, David? And and you've put, you've put an actual uh, source in 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 the chat. Um, uh, tell us your concern. I'm no expert on this, and I love trees uh, greatly as well. I enjoy walking in them. But I've seen arguments that there are these uh, potential tipping points. Uh, clearly, we're seeing lots of forests burning down as the world's heated up. There are more forest fires and huge amounts of uh, embedded carbon dioxide is released in such a way. So it's already been said by Matthew that the, this is a potential adverse feedback mechanism. As the world heats up too much, suddenly things which previously were carbon sources or carbon stores now become carbon sinks. So I, I just want to put that on the table and maybe ask, I mean, artificial trees sound horrible. We all shudder and say, well, shouldn't we have natural trees? But the, I, I've seen some research saying that there could be artificial trees which uh, suck CO2 out of the atmosphere in much the same way as real trees do, but wouldn't be prone to the same emissions. Is that something that we should look at a bit more? It's a really interesting question. Of course, it, it, um, it dove, uh, dovetails with the argument about Geoengineering. I, I know of uh, one London academic who's working on precisely that. He used to run the uh, Microsoft Science Centre at, at Cambridge, and uh, I see him walking around my local park quite often now. But um, let me uh, come back to Rebecca on on this question of how to do it right. I mean, the, the fires in particular in the Amazon in um, uh, Central Africa in in uh, Australia 18, 18 months ago uh, have been turning what should have been carbon sinks into massive carbon sources. Yep. Um, how do you do it right? And if you were given megalomaniac powers, uh, I, I know you were shying away in a sense from, from talking about uh, hundreds of millions of hectares, but I, I really, I think this was one of the things that was captivating for non-specialists about Tom Crowther's research was, was the sense of possibility, was that, oh my God, here's somebody who has used those satellites uh, that Tom was talking about to take another look at the planet. It's kind of bigger than we thought. There are, there are bigger empty spaces than we thought. There is more scope. Um, is that true? And if so, where are they? And, and, and um, if your powers were limitless, how would you set about reforesting them? So I think, um... I often, in terms of space and kind of the the easy easy wins in this area, we often say that we could just focus on restoring degraded agricultural land. And the reason we say that is because that is the low hanging fruit. It means that the land was productive, so you know that it can support uh, it can support plantings of some form. Uh, it usually has access to roads, to water, etc. Um, and it was, and as I mentioned, it was that that productive area because so much of the world is actually very difficult, is in difficult terrain to access. I can't, I can't over, like under, uh, I can't explain how difficult it is to restore degraded land, and that's why it's one of the biggest challenges is to re-kickstart these ecosystems. And we're talking about really remote places in the world that are, we operate with complicated machinery. Um, you're talking about water trucks. You're talking about getting seedlings to the field, the journey of the tree to the field. One thing we focus on is how do we expand the planting window by getting the seedlings to the tree, uh, the seedlings to the fields faster and in a place where they are gonna be able to establish themselves earlier on. The logistics of tree planting are so overwhelming and complex that we need, there's, and there are many places where we can start that it is actually quite easy. And I think that that's what we've chosen to focus on as a company is where there's so much degraded land, 2 billion hectares of degraded land. How much of that do we even want to plant on? We put more of the estimate around 200 million hectares compared to the 500 million hectares. Um, but that is because of analysis we've done on feasibility and accessibility for us to be able to manage to reach these places and to effectively plant in them and to restore them. Some areas are, are just lost. And I think that that's, that's sort of the big question is where do we devote, we only have a certain window of time, where do we devote our time and energy and resources 
um, to kind of create the biggest possible impact that we can. Are there places where governments could help significantly surmount these logistical obstacles? I'm thinking, for example, of Russia. So I'm not I'm not as familiar with with Russia. What do you mean by the the governance there or land uh, access? Well, just uh, the very large space is difficult yeah. to get to um, Russia, and and, and I, I believe uh, uh, Kazakhstan as well, northern Kazakhstan. Um, yeah. No, so I think there's there's a lot um, there's a lot that they can do to help with um, I would say. Um, the frameworks and the governance around these actions. Again, to go ahead and, and plant trees at scale means access to land. Land still needs to be locally owned and, man, and maintained. So you need to devise the legal agreements or the access rights to make all of this possible. And I realize this sounds very granular and very detailed, but it is really critical the role that governments can play here mm -hmm. in making that land available and facilitating access rights. Uh, you know, our, our growth as a company is limited by plots available to plant, which sounds ridiculous given the scale that we're talking about that requires reforestation. But to get a landowner to commit to planting trees on their property, whether they are public or private, and to maintain that forest and to not cut it down, either for 40 years, 100 years, or in perpetuity, is no small feat. And you are going right now almost door to door to make that happen. So I do think the governments could play a big role in making that process a little bit more streamlined, making that more accessible. And again, I think that's why I keep struggling with your questions about magnitude, because I know the realities on the ground of actually making this possible. And, and the issue is actually land availability for these right. projects for a company like ours, uh, which is in direct contrast to kind of the magnitude of the challenge we're facing. No, that, that's really interesting. And I, I take that in the spirit in which I think it was intended as a kind of a of a reality check. Uh, while we talk, and I'd like uh, um, uh, to come to Isabel Hilton, uh, if we can, in a second, because she was making an interesting further point about the world's biggest carbon sink in Brazil. But um, how's business, Rebecca? And the same question for, um, for, for Matthew. I'm curious to know, do you have sort of bona fide clients queuing up for the offsetting products that you offer, which enable you to expand what you do? Yes, uh, it's been a drastic change in the past two years. Uh, we are seven years, um, uh, we founded the company seven years ago and it was uh, five years of education, pounding on doors, trying to convince people of the benefits of reforestation, convincing them that you could invest in new forests, uh, you know, so ex ante, uh, versus ex post, and that had benefits that consumers in the world would appreciate. Um, you know, to all of a sudden, you know, two years later, just having way more demand than we can than we can manage, taking um, you know cu customer interest a couple years out, and it is because these corporations are afraid of the world of taxation uh, and regulation that they feel is coming. So the I used to um, I used to speak to you know. The head of CSR in a company. And now I'm speaking to the in-house economist of a company who is thinking I'm going to invest in a new tree planting project because that is going to be cheaper than what I would have to pay on EU ETS if all of a sudden all of my emissions were, were regulated in this way. And I don't mind that because if it is of financial interest, the more that we can move reforestation and the climate agenda to the center of companies, to something that they're accountable and on the hook for, the more, the more uh, it will make this an actual sector, which has its, which has significant benefits in terms of unlocking capital, increasing the rules of uh, the rules of the road and regulation around this market, the transparency in this market. Like I said, lots of people can tell you how many trees they planted, but not how many are alive today and the impact that they're having. So for me, this has been a, a very positive movement. Um, but you know, we get lots of questions. Well, isn't this company's greenwashing? And I think. Right now, we are, um, we are fortunate in that there is so much demand that we are able to work just with companies who have shown that they have an energy transition plan, and this is part of their energy transition plan to compensate for the emissions that they can't just magically turn into renewables tomorrow. Um, but, you know, we get, we get a lot of requests from people who don't have those plans as well, unfortunately. 
And what do you, how do you respond to them? Do you triage them out? Yeah, no, uh, we, uh, for example, we have a policy in our company that we, we don't have any oil and gas, for example, on our, on our, as an investor to, that would have any sort of influence on the steer of the company. Um, and then we filter through oil and gas companies that have, we go through their targets with them. It's a, a weird dating process, if you will, uh, together, uh, which was not what I would have imagined three years ago, but is certainly a position I'm happy that we're, uh, we're in. You can choose, in other words. Yeah. 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 How interesting. Uh, Matthew, t- uh, is that roughly the, your experience? Is, I mean, in brute terms, has business picked up? Yeah, massively. I'd say, you know, really in the last 18 months, it's hugely accelerated. I call it the, I call it the Greta effect ever since, you know, we, we really started seeing Greta and her message going mainstream. But, but also, as Rebecca says, I'm sure from, from a lot of corporates perspective, there's, you know, financial aspects to this as well and the threat of a carbon tax and everything else. Um, and it really leads me to reiterate what Rebecca's been saying all along, which is, is that, you know, we're now supply constrained uh, when it comes to generating carbon credits from certainly from afforestation in the UK. Uh, and there are various reasons for that. But, you know, Scotland's a good case in point. We have a lot of um, putatively empty land in the highlands of Scotland, but, but actually it's, it, a lot of it isn't available to reforestation for a mixture of environmental and social reasons. Um, and until the price of carbon gets a lot, lot higher, I don't think we'll see uh, the incentives swinging the balance. Uh, and I now have a situation where I'm talking to lots of businesses who want to buy offsets and they all want to buy carbon credits generated by trees and by tree planting. And I'm having to explain to them as well that, you know, there are other ecosystems that also are massively in need of restoration, preservation, expansion, such as peatlands, such as all the marine habitats like kelp forests and seagrass meadows. And it would be great if we could start channeling some of the impetus and some of the desire for, for carbon offsetting and for carbon neutrality in particular into some of these other ecosystems in, in recognition of, of the role that all of our ecosystems can and will hopefully play in, in helping us to meet our climate and biodiversity targets. And generally, do you find them persuadable? It depends on the ecosystem, Giles. Um, I think a lot of people like the idea of seagrass meadows. Trying to sell them peat bogs proves a little more difficult. I need to find some way to make bogs a bit sexier, but I haven't quite cracked it yet. Well, uh, you should send around the the piece that Simon Barnes wrote for Tortoise recently in praise of peat bogs and uh, in in homage to their complexity, their environmental complexity. So we'll make that available to you. Yeah, I think, I mean, once you once you present the statistics to people, once you tell them that peatland is our largest terrestrial carbon store, by a long way in the UK and how much more carbon it locks up per hectare than, than forest does, you know, they're very persuaded by it. But I think peelings are a um, perennially overlooked habitat and they, and they always have been. Um, and, and we need to start rewriting that story. Thanks, Matthew. Now, I did want to come to Isabel Hilton if, if we could, because she has a great facility with detail um, uh, and was gonna, I was gonna ask her about soy in Brazil but that may not be possible. Um, uh, any yeah, sign of visible? I'm Isn't here. That? I am. Oh, um, fantastic. I can hear you, but I can't see you. Um, not sure what I can do about that. Uh, oh, hang on. Start my video. How's that? There you go. Um, Thanks. So what's the point you're making about uh, soy in Brazil? Because I mean, anything to do with the Amazon basin is fascinating to me because it's a bit like anything to do with China, because apart from anything else, you know it's happening at scale. It is happening at scale. There's a huge demand actually across Latin America from China for soy. China doesn't produce enough soy. It's also because it's developing its own animal husbandry on a very big scale. It needs soy for animal feed, um, fish feed, all kinds of things. Um, And it's been a major driver of deforestation in the Amazon, including um, importantly in Brazil. Bolsonaro frames the protection of the Amazon as a favor that he would consider doing to the world if he got if he was paid well enough for it. Um, but what that leaves out is the fact that it's Brazil that will suffer first from the loss of the Amazon because Brazil's rainfall is generated by the Amazon. It's a bit like imagining the South Asian monsoon without the Himalayan um, glaciers. It, you know, it's going to be very different if they're at all. And that's true of, of uh, Brazilian rainfall. So the soy, which is you know, a kind of quick hit, it's a kind of cash crop, meeting uh, Chinese demand um, 
is faltering because of lack of rainfall already. There was a major drought which afflicted Sao Paulo uh, four or five years ago. Uh, so so these, these effects are really quite immediate. So Bolsonaro is trading a kind of short-term uh, hit on, on a, a reward on cash crops for sustainability, which will be far more damaging in the long run. Uh, what's your take, since we're on this, about his trustworthiness? Tom advised us to... Um, Go, go carefully. Very um, large pinch of salt, I would say. I mean, his entire model has been a military-backed exploitation of the Amazon, and the, and the Brazilian military have wanted to uh, exploit the Amazon. They regarded it as the, you know, the great green frontier for, for decades. So they're very happy uh, to provide the kind of enforcement that that mining and, and you know, other capital projects need in the Amazon. I, I think he is absolutely fundamentally not interested in conservation and doesn't understand it. Uh, and are you optimistic that he'll be replaced by Lula? He's not doing very well right now. So, yeah, I, um, that's looking rather brighter than it was. We'll keep the rest of that conversation for a future thinking about um, Latin American politics. But, um, Tom, can I come back to you? Uh, we've got uh, uh, about five minutes left. In your um, TED talk, you talk about, you talk about, uh, it, it's quite spiritual, and you talk about your own background at, at, at one point I um you you were a monk or you were you were trained to, you were a monk uh, yeah. uh and yeah. you say that it doesn't make very good stories I'm afraid being a monk but yeah carry on it, it is in itself a terrific story but you talk about the stubborn optimism that I think you sort of trace trace back to that Rebecca has explained in in um some detail that there is a bit of a gulf between uh, a Tom Crowther style vision for global reforestation and what is practical um, uh, in the time available, uh, on the land available, given all the constraints that are imposed by governments and local economies and things like that. Do you, do you nonetheless remain stubbornly optimistic about this, the, the, the central role that uh, you you said at the top you you reckon that trees and forests should be playing in this debate well let me answer that briefly because i know we're short of time but just in a slightly roundabout way and that's to say that i really love rebecca and 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 and, and matthew's answer earlier about the state of their business which is fantastic but i'm worried and I'm worried because net zero is now under full frontal attack as a concept. And there is a large proportion of people that really don't like this idea. And I'm old enough to remember when we went down this road before in 2008, and it was effectively killed by you know, NGO activists who had very legitimate concerns in some cases. But what they really rejected was the idea of this kind of get out of jail free concept that really riled them, this emotional reaction. People should do something meaningful. They shouldn't have this out right which is a strong reaction against it and the reason i start there is because it speaks to how you develop an attitude of how you change the world in my experience of the paris agreement working with christiana and learning from her and with her and seeing how the world went from this state of a pessimistic challenged it's never going to be possible we can't make any progress there's a million reasons why we'll never manage to get this done to the breakthrough that it was imperfect as it is and actually what we saw then was the key to changing the world was not a perfection of strategy. It was momentum in the right direction. Once you get going, once you develop a sense of possibility, a sense of determination, a sense of enthusiasm, that there's something here that we can do, that we can move forward, we can be successful in, in the biggest challenges that face us, and we can actually dig in now. And this is where this concept comes from, right? With a gritty and determined, stubborn optimism that doesn't deny the challenges that we're facing, but refuses to, to accept that they're beyond our ability to meet. And that's been true at many moments throughout history. Actually, this optimism is most relevant when the outlook is the darkest. Think about these, you know, these moments of like fight them on the beaches, I have a dream, salt marches to the beach. These were really dark moments that were hard to live through. And people actually found a way to meet that with a sense of determination and momentum. And then the strategy changed as we went. And I'm worried that this concept of net zero that is imperfect, that has a whole bunch of problems with it, but that the world is finally clicking into gear behind, that we will deal with this issue. This net zero is now spreading like wildfire, companies, countries, cities, and others. I think we need to protect that. That's a very precious 
resource that we've spent years building and it needs to be improved. It's true. There are some people playing fast and loose and marking their own homework, but actually the vast majority of companies want to do the right thing, are reducing and offsetting and investing in nature. And we cannot afford to tear that down now because the ideology doesn't fit with where we are. We have to use it. We have to build on it and we have to go forward and use that as a momentum for change. Tom, thank you. That's really a lot of food for thought because I'm not close enough to this to have sensed the idea of net zero being under attack. In the couple of minutes left, uh, let, let's go to Matthew first and then Rebecca. Do you agree that the concept is under, as Tom puts it, full frontal attack? And uh, allow your optimism uh, to uh, um, express itself. Given that business is on an uptick, where do you see yourself uh, and in terms of scale in five years or no, at the end of the decade? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm perhaps the wrong person to, to answer or to speak to Tom's concern because I'm, I'm to a degree sheltered by the work I do and all the businesses who are coming to me are the ones who are taking climate change very seriously, who are setting internal net zero goals and who very much do believe that that is the way to go. Um, that said, I have I have one slight wrinkle with the concept myself, but um, I'm I'm fully on board with the idea. But the um, what's the, the wrinkle? The stipulation that you can only offset using removal uh, um, credits as opposed to avoidance credits. So a removal credit is something like a growing woodland, which is actually pulling CO two out of the atmosphere, versus an avoidance credit, which could be something as um, you know providing someone with a cleaner stove uh, to cook with. Um, I really understand the rationale there, but in, in the very specific terms that I deal with it in, 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 in our business, it's leading to people not wanting to support peatland restoration because peatland restoration avoids greenhouse gas emissions, whereas tree planting or reforestation draws carbon into those ecosystems. And, and it is turning lots of businesses off because they think we're not going to be able to tick the net zero box properly if we invest in peatland restoration. And that's a sort of slightly perverse outcome from it but but I must you know I must couch that in the fact that I fully support net zero and, and I, I think we need to see all businesses getting behind it and really you know doing their homework making the effort to understand what it looks like if they put themselves on a on a 1.5 degree aligned pathway um, and and ensuring that they reduce before they offset and that's always got to be the default you reduce as much as you can and you only offset the residual until you've managed to decarbonize even the residual in terms of where I see our business being in a decade, I, I think the market is evolving and changing too quickly for me to say. I mean, um, I, I think there's potential for massive expansion, but there's also potential um, for, for this market to, to uh, you know, to explode and to become a bit of a bubble. A bubble. So, um, so I'm just going to have to strap myself in and see how it goes. Fascinating. Rebecca, how about you? Yes, no, so I think having... Um having uh, pounded the pavement as we did for all of those years, now that the, the doors are open, one of our real uh, points of focus is to make sure that reforestation and climate action permeates throughout multiple parts of the business, because there is that fear that this all explodes and goes away. And I, you know, trying maybe tactfully to think about it, well, if it is part of your marketing strategy, if it is core to your operations, if there are uh, fiscal and reporting issues and accounting issues for you as a company, all related to this one issue, the harder it is going to be for you as a company to, you know, let it go and to uh, change change course. So I think, you know, having having learned through how important it is to embed climate mitigation and action in all parts of the organization. That's really the approach that we've taken to protect kind of this momentum and this, and this focus. Um, regarding net zero, I mean, I, I have the same, uh, the same um, issues with it, but I think I'm, at this stage and given this level of urgency, I'm very comfortable with uh, um, what was just said about we don't need perfection right now. I want to be deliberate, but I don't want to be perfect. You know, I want to be thoughtful. I want to be counseled. I want feedback on how we do our reforestation projects, how this is all done. But uh, perfection is a, is an intellectual exercise right now that I don't I don't think we can afford. And we should use this optimism and use this movement um, to keep pushing forward and refining as we learn and as and as we go along. Um, I think it would be such a mistake, uh, catastrophic to, to wait. 
Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Matthew and everybody else. Uh, and see you soon. <laughs>